I said, hi, is this Helen? She said, yes, this is. And I said, I think that you are my birth mother. And her response was at first one that was very relieved that I was alive, that I was well. She said two things. One, no one ever knew about us. Welcome back to At the End of the Tunnel. This is the podcast that shines a light on the journey of regular people who've taken extraordinary leaps of faith to start movements that have helped to make life just a little bit better for the people along their path. In this episode, I'll be talking to a dear friend of mine who happens to be a transracial adoptee, and she is going to tell us about her fascinating journey of being adopted by a white family in New England and how she basically had to teach herself what it means to be black in America and how she found her birth family, even though her adoption records were technically sealed and how she was initially rejected by her birth mother, but things eventually worked out and how all of that led to her starting a foster care mentoring program known as Adoptment. April Dinwiddie takes us into the fascinating world of the adoption process. And for those of you who are considering adoption, and especially if you're thinking about adopting a transracial child, you'll definitely get a lot out of this episode. I find that the way April unpacks the complex topics of race and family to be so insightful and inspiring, and I hope you will as well. So on that note, I'm honored to introduce you to my dear friend, Miss April Dinwiddie. Thank you very much, April, for coming on to the podcast. As always, I like to start these conversations by talking about childhood. <laughs> Specifically, what was a toy or activity that you remember enjoying as a child? Well, I enjoyed lots of things as a as a child, but the most enjoyable times with a material item would have been reading and the specific books that I enjoyed reading as a, as a smaller child were Disney books. There were these hard bound, beautiful colored books that they were like my prized possessions. And I loved those books and I read them cover to cover thousands of times over. It feels like. Any particular story that stands out or that still stands out from those Disney books? Oh, the usual Cinderella, you know. Um, <laughs> I Little Red Riding Hood. Is that Little Red Riding Hood? Is that Disney? I don't know. That's a good question. I wouldn't be That's surprised if it was. I think that was. I mean, I'm not sure. I can't, I can't really recall, but the, you know, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. What was it about those books that, that you, you feel – that you liked? What, what, was, what was it about those books that you really liked? Well, tactilely, like I loved the way they felt and I loved the way they, the pages looked. I loved the colors. I just loved the they were these, the, you know, these like hardcover, beautiful books. I, so I loved, I just loved the way they felt and the way they looked. But I think the content was such that I could identify with what was a general theme in these books of, you know, family of origin disconnection uh, as an adopted person, like having a sort of complicated family. While I probably couldn't name it then as a kid, I, I think there was some recognition to, oh, that seems familiar to me. And I see that in my own life. And then obviously the fairy tale, which was you know, the happy ending, the, the struggle to the place of, you know, beauty and joy and, you know, happiness. So let's talk about that for a minute. You, you were adopted. You're biracial. Is that the proper term for it? Biracial? Yeah, sure. One or more, <laughs> <laughs> more, two or more races. Yeah. Biracial. Yeah. Multiracial. <laughs> Multiracial. You were adopted by a white family in Rhode Island. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, when you're experiencing these books, how old are you and how aware are you of 
what it means to be adopted and what was the general state around all of that with your family dynamics? So being brown, biracial, black, all of that, you know, being different than my family, I always knew I was adopted. I don't remember that moment when I was brought into a special room. We sat down and said, okay, we have something to tell you, April, which many of my peers who have also experienced adoption have had that experience at various stages of their life. I don't remember that. It was just something that I always knew. There wasn't a lot of explanation around this idea of adoption. It was just like, it was a fact. This was my family. Innately, just because I think of how I'm designed, I like I did think a lot about what I would say now is family structure, what I wouldn't probably be able to name them was just like difference of you know, my family, like, and, and knowing for sure that there was another family out in the world or other people I was connected to. Again, we didn't talk about it. it so, so when I think about those books and why I, I probably loved them was a sort of recognition of something's going on here. I'm not exactly sure what it, what it is, but in the end, you know, everything is going to be okay. Right. Like sort of, that's the, the little journey as it, plays to, to my experience. Again, I didn't, it's not something we talked about, but I knew inherently that there was something different in my family structure that, that probably, or definitely required more attention and conversation that it was being given. And being in those books gave me a, a sort of a sense of almost validation and grounding in it in, in a sort of way. So I grew up in Alabama and in Montgomery, Alabama, which was the cradle of the Confederacy. It was the launching point for the modern day civil rights movement. So race was a really big part of the conversation in my family. And I'm curious, growing up as a biracial person, a brown person in a white family, how did you see race as a child when you were coming up? And were you even aware of those kinds of distinctions on a deeper level than just, oh, they look different from me. Yeah, I was. And it started with like the physical differences. And my family was the family that really approached this transracial adoption experience as one that was, oh, we don't see color. We'll love her. Everything will be fine. And the adoption agency, the professionals at that point also sort of really sort of set the tone for that, sanctioned that, said, you know, she might be biracial. They didn't even really confirm that in my paperwork. It's confirmed, but, or it's not even confirmed. It's like they dance around the subject of she might be biracial there. She saw, but she was seen by a geneticist. So, so from sort of jump, it was like, well, that's not something we have to deal with. Right. So for me, I always sort of felt like, not that I was treated different with it, differently within my family. Within my family, it was one thing. But out in the world, it was, it was a completely different story in terms of what I was experiencing, in terms of how I was seen in the world. And I think I knew very young that this was much more than just being physically different from my family in terms of our, 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 our physical characteristics, there, there was a difference in how people treated me. And I felt that early on. Now, I also thought that everyone had a brown or black person in their house like my family did because we spent a lot of time together. And I just assumed that, that everybody had one person that looked like me in their family. So when I went to school and I noticed that there were not... <laughs> other people that looked like me, I thought, okay, they're coming tomorrow or the next day, or maybe they'll come next year. I just always, and I was always waiting and anticipating for more folks that looked like me. There were other folks that looked like me, uh, like two girls that I grew up with who were both biracial as well, and some other people of color, but it was far and few between. It was like, you know, the, the, dem- the, the population by race was very, very white, like in the upper 90s. When did it dawn on you that you were unique and different? Your situation, that is. 
You know, I don't know if there was a moment there. I just always felt the energy around it. The, there are a couple of moments that it was solidified, you know, in some, in some ways of going, oh, right, there's something going on here. Again, not being able to name it as a kid, not having language for it or, or really an, uh, a psychological or an emotional safety in terms of being able to voice these things because it just, we didn't talk about it. So it was always a little bit like, oh, should I say something? But I was walking with a friend's mother who was caring for me, but I'm not exactly sure why we were in town or a little small town and someone approached her asking her if I was a fresh air kid. And for those who don't know, the fresh air fund is an organization that takes usually black and brown kids who are from urban areas and brings them into suburban areas for summer, for summers. And generally, you know, I don't know what the numbers are now, but at that point, I, I wouldn't be surprised if it's that different today, that it was usually white families welcoming and kids of color. So in my town, you know, in the summer, which we had a lot of people coming in, because we were a little beach town in New England, but a lot of people coming in and out. And most folks in the town knew me and knew my family. But the summer, the 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 sort of the footprint was a little bit different. And so folks would would be in town that wouldn't normally be in town and someone approached a stranger, approached my friend's mother and was like, Oh, you have a fresh air kid. And she was like, no, she lives here. And she was very agitated. And I remember thinking, well, what's the big deal? I love fresh air. Fresh air is good. You need it to live. Like I was like, <laughs> fresh air, what is the big deal? And she, her energy kind of like told me by her body language and her tone that something was off and I was different. And I didn't really belong there. So there were times like that where I was like, oh, right. Like this is a thing, right? Like being singled out in classes good for, for sort of being as being a novelty and also being someone who was misbehaving when, you know, my white peer was doing the same thing I was doing. And I was the one that got sort of pulled to the side. So there were times where it was more poignant, but I, I don't think I ever remember feeling like there wasn't something more to the story around not just my family and other people out there that belonged to me and I belonged to from a relative standpoint, but also that, that there was something else going on around me being brown and biracial and my family not. I, I just always felt that way. And did that inspire a level of curiosity that grew as you got older, as you became like a teenager and started go, getting into college and things like that? Absolutely. I mean, it was a, a deep level of, of curiosity and, and a lot of times chaos and confusion accompanied it, right? It was like, okay, like I'm tracking with all this. I, I, I almost also knew from a very early stage that my family that was raising me, my family of experience, as I like to say it, were not equipped to do any more that they than they were doing. Like that was also something that was sort of sort of advanced in some ways, and also sort of meeting my own my own needs. Like just this undercurrent of like, all right, like you know that you're you kind of have to do this on your own. So the curiosity was was about uh, like an internalized curiosity. I mean, I was constantly tracking sort of other people's movements and, and looking at things and, and that continues today. And, and now I have the language for it and have the skills and the capacity to do that and to help others do that. But back then it was just, it was there. It was a sort of steady flow of like energy around it without, a, without an outlet for it. Right. So the question of who am I really, that's what it's like, who am I? And where do I fit? Like I was early in that, I think f then for most kids, just because of the dynamic of my family and, and our town too. Who would you talk to about this? Or if anyone growing up, if you realize your parent, your parents couldn't really give you any more than you were getting from them. Was there someone else that you would confide in or, or, or speak to about this? No. No, it was, and it was compound, right? It was first, like we, we speak not of adoption, right? And, and this being separated from one family and transplanted into another, we speak not of that. And not because there was any shame in it or any, or any 
there was there were there wasn't this like sort of like this orchestrated way in which we were living that my parents were 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 working through it wasn't even like that it just didn't it wasn't a thing like they didn't they didn't believe it it mattered on some level right so it was that first that wasn't we didn't speak of and then it was well you're just like everybody else so we didn't speak of that either so I, it was rare if ever even to the girls that were friends of mine growing up but we didn't speak of we didn't speak of it. I, I don't know exactly why. And I'm sure there were conversations, but more so getting into probably high school, but it was rare. We were just, we were just trying to make it, you know, we didn't know how to negotiate these conversations. So a lot of it for me was an internal dialogue and a questioning and a, like a noticing while at the same time, trying to keep myself quite frankly, sort of emotionally, physically, and psychologically safe. Now I'm a light skinned biracial woman. And I always say, like, had I been a dark skinned black boy, my life would have been very different in this community. So my safety, my physical safety was less about what we're sort of experiencing today in terms of the sort of more of the physical brutality and more of like in a psychological and emotional safety. B, let's be clear, there were also unsafe physical moments as well where I'd be chased or I would feared for something bad to happen. And I just instinctively rewired something and got out of there. Like that was just, that was just in me. So thankfully there were no physical altercations that, that could have happened. Um, and, and they just didn't thank God. What was your, your mental state growing up? Were you pretty happy as a child or what were you, what were you feeling? Yeah. I mean, I think generally I was happy. There's this thing, though, that it was also a reality is that, you know, I, I have this monthly sort of like thematic thing that I do because my family of origin, my birth mother, um, my mother of origin named me June and my adoptive family named me April. And so, and I'm born in October. So all these months of the year, like have me sort of always like hanging on different themes in the month. And one of the ones in April is April showers bring May flowers because I was a crier as a kid. I cried a lot. And my family of experience were not criers and not, they did not really show emotion the way I did. And again, that was something that I, I recognized immediately, you know, as soon as I could, it was like young, great grammar school early on that, oh, I'm doing something that doesn't really happen in this family. And it, and it actually, they don't like it you know, and they don't like it, meaning, you know, no one likes it when a kid cries, I don't think, but they don't like it, meaning it's, it's like, and there was like, stop, your crying, stop crying. Why are you crying? You know, my brother called me baby wah wah. <laughs> like, cause I would cry, <laughs> I would cry it often and I would cry at big things, little things. I would cry when I was happy. I would cry when I was sad. I cried a lot. And I think, so speaking to the mental state, I feel like there was this like some innate confusion and sadness and chaos around my experience and what I was what I was feeling inside. And yet I had this like kind of amazing life and we lived on a farm and we had all kinds of animals and we had an in-ground pool. We didn't have a lot of money, but we, we sort of had these little things that like made life really nice for us that I, that I felt held by. And that, so there was this real both and, which was, I both had this beautiful, amazing family who had a lot of love and a lot of amazing pieces and parts to them. And I had a lot of sadness about the loss of my family of origin, which I didn't know how to name or couldn't understand. And had a lot of confusion and chaos around being different from my family and looking different, being treated differently. So it, it, it was both and, and I, as I developed throughout high school and, and, and that in early life, it turned to anger at certain points as, as often these things do for teenagers and that played out. But for the most part, my sort of my constitution is one of strength and like, like muscling through things that also comes from new England upbringing, like, you know, sort of keep it moving. Do I wish there were more soft places? Absolutely. But, you know, has that served me today in a way to, to kind of, to, to be able to kind of grip my teeth through some stuff? I, you know what? I think, I think so. Mm -hmm. And then you and I crossed paths in your 20s. We were both in our 20s, actually. You we were working in marketing. And I remember when we volunteered together 
at the uh, I forget the organization that was in Harlem though for Foster Kids. Mm-hmm. Was it for it was Foster Kids, right? We did a mentoring program, right? Was it the mentor? Was it yeah. like on yeah. the east side of Harlem? That's right. It was a Harlem mentoring. Was that your first time volunteering? Sort of. I mean, I, I was a Brownie Girl Scout, so we did some volunteering there as, as a kid. And then, you know, I did a, some summer camps for cheerleading that were paid, but sort of like volunteering. So in Harlem with young people in a or, really organized way, that was that, that Harlem East Side program was the first time I had done it in, in more of an organized fashion, yes. And what, what impressions did that leave upon you? Because I was doing it, you know, I, I, I didn't, I wasn't adopted. I came from two parent household. So for me, it was kind of like I got an opportunity to work with kids who were kind of like my little cousins or something like that. But I, from your perspective, coming from where you came from and your experience with adoption, did that leave a different impression? on you that kind of led to the things that you ended up getting into later, which we'll talk about in this conversation. Yeah, for sure. For sure. So while I went about the desire to do that program, because I'd always been sort of in tune with young people and, and kind of like interested in being around them and uh, any age, really, I just enjoyed them. And so When an opportunity came to be to do some mentoring, I was like all for it. And and it was in the neighborhood that I was living and that felt good too, or at least close to a neighborhood that I loved um, and was getting to know. So it all made sense. What was enlightening about that was the realization that these at-risk, labeled at-risk, not that I would call them at-risk, labeled at-risk through the program, young people all pretty much had this the same experience of a complicated family experience, whether that was child welfare engagement, you know, foster care, or just some form of, of challenge within their family of experience, abuse, neglect, divorce, remarriage, you know, some of these things that just cross all socioeconomic and race, class and culture elements. But, you know, it, it came to me that, wow, like, duh, like, if your family isn't tight and like in a good place, like God's are you as a kid are going to be kind of all over the place. So it started to make a lot of sense to me that we should be paying attention to family structure. We should be paying attention to kids experiences and their families. And because of my family experience and, and I, I, I sort of sort of understood some of these dynamics early on, I feel like it made me tune in much more to asking questions about family and what was going on at home, not being intrusive or invading privacy, but really just figuring out how to ask the right questions to, to get some more intel in order to be a better mentor and guide for a young person. And then being able to say, yeah, I, I get it on another level, maybe not exactly but where you're coming from, but I get when, when family is complicated, I understand that and I can make a space to validate some of what you're feeling and thinking around that. And in the meantime, you had started a more intentional search around finding your birth family. What what triggered that at that point in your life, in your your mid-20s? This was always in the back of my mind. I mean, I, from, from the time I first kind of really left the nest of my home and was out in the world, I, even at school, I, I would think on a regular basis, oh, today's the day that my, my mom or dad are going to come and get me. You know, and it wasn't like I didn't like the mom and dad that I had. I just thought like, oh yeah, they're just going to come and get me one day. Like I just thought that that would be a thing. So I always sort of been thinking about them more so times a year, Mother's Day, my birthday, Father's Day, I think of like, this other family s- system that was out there. And then for sure, moving to New York, like making the intentional decision to plant myself in New York and gaining confidence there, like getting a sort of a big corporate job at a very young age, you know, seeing the world in a different way. I was like, I can do, I can do this, like just transactionally even. 
I was like, I can do it. You know, I, I, I know people that are attorneys and I know people who can look up a file or, you know, I was like, oh, like I, I can transactionally do this. So I did start more intentionally doing that. And I took my time because I, what I knew, but didn't quite know how to support myself in it was that I knew that while the transactions could happen, the emotional transformation would be a whole nother story. And, and not that I actually scaffolded myself perfectly, but I, I think I did a, a decent job of it and found a support group and just gave my family enough of like a sense of what I was doing, but not knowing that I knew they couldn't walk with me to do it on some level, or maybe I was too sensitive to and worried about hurting them. So I didn't ask them to walk with me. So it's, there were so many things it was like, but mostly the, the impetus was wanting to do something that I had long wanted to do. And now having the, you know, sort of the, the material like access to individuals and, and maybe some finances to do certain things. And then thinking that I deserve this, <laughs> I, I'm someone who deserves their full kind of life experience and I think that was why that was then, like that was, that's why it happened then was a combination of those things. Can you talk a little bit about the difference in open files versus closed files and how the whole adoption system works in your experience and why you didn't have the information initially growing up? Sure. Sure. And about the night before like the 1930s ish, all adoptions were open. Uh, so if you were adopted your birth certificate was not changed. It was not sealed. In some cases it was changed, but the original birth certificate was not sealed. Uh, around the thirties, that started to change. It became like a whole new wave of like uh, sort of a business around adoption, foster care stuff. And what that did was, you know, put this um, more systematic approach to this way in which adoptions were processed. And the, the conventional wisdom at the time was, you know, it's much better for everyone. It's easier if we simply sort of start from scratch and lock that away. And most of that was what was what is said, uh, like, this is protecting the family of origin, a birth mother, uh, or birth parents, protect them by sealing the original birth certificate. So it was so shameful to not, you know, parent your kid, or to be unwed and pregnant. So society kind of came in and said, Okay, we have an idea. Let's seal this away, pretend it never happened, and then we'll create a new birth certificate with the family of experience or the adoptive family's information on it, and then everybody will ride off into the sunset and everything will be fine. And uh, only two states kept sort of the more open way, which was Alaska and Kansas. Every other state at some point or another started to close adoptions, create a new birth certificate, and then... That is what I had. I had had an amended birth certificate that had Tom and Sandra Dinwiddie on it. And that's what you use to, to get your social security number, to get your, um, or to get your social security card, to get your passport, to move in the world. That were, those are your receipts, if you will. But there was, unfortunately, those receipts were not actually all filled with true information. So we're the only sort of class of people, adopted persons who don't have access to some of that. And so some states have now started to open their records. But I think, I don't know, the numbers now is probably between 10 and 12 states actually have some form of opening records at the age of 18 or access for adopted persons to those records. But many states don't. And, you know, it's a big advocacy movement. And, you know, I mean, now with 23andMe and Ancestry DNA, it's not if, it's when some folks can find each other. So we're not operating today with the sense of reality in terms of what we can and can't keep from people. And, you know, all of that to say that, you know, it, it signals this idea that one, you know, adoptive persons are less than and don't deserve these things. And two, that you do not have to face the hard parts of negotiating life circumstances that may be difficult, but yet deserve to be dealt with and, and to be held with honor and respect and truth. So there's a lot of unraveling that's happening right now with all things and adoption is no different. So that's sort of the form one on, on the process and what that actually, I think, means to adoption yesterday and today. And so you basically, since your adoption was considered, I guess, closed, you had to become a bit of a private eye when you decided to take the first steps to discovering who your family, your birth family was. What was the first, what, what, what were those first steps like? So the first step for me was to ask my parents what they had. 
uh, in terms of paperwork. And of course, they went down to a file and they had some paperwork. They had some information about the agency that transacted the adoption. I did some, I started doing some research in terms of what you can and can't do. And in the state of Rhode Island at that time, you could get your not identifying information from the state and the adoption agency, which is what I got. And which is, it can be everything from female age and religion to more of a narrative, which is what I had, which was more about my mother of origins, uh, family and backstory, of course, not her name or their names, but a description of who my birth father was as well. And a lot of information, which so when pe- when I got that and I shared it with some other folks who were in their search as well, they were like, wow, that's actually a lot. And given the fact that Rhode Island and Newport, where my birth mother was when she had me, is so small, you know, I, st- I started to put some pieces together and then I ultimately engaged with what's called a search angel, which is someone who, you know, pretty much volunteers their time, usually a member of the community that um, helps you get information. And that person got me a name and an address. And one day I just took a ride and knocked on a door. Where was this door that you knocked on? Was it in Rhode Island? In yep, New York? It was in Newport. Yep. Newport, Rhode Island. And there was a family there. There were, was a couple there that I told some story, uh, you know, I, that I was looking for, like, a, I was doing a family genetics, family history project, or whatever. And they invited me in and they, the minute they invited me in, I was like, oh boy, I can't, I just couldn't keep like a secret going or a lie moving. I said, look, I'm adopted. I think my, my birth mom lived in this house. They said, oh, please come and sit down. Um, they were actually adoptive parents, uh, white adoptive parents of two biracial kids. So they like wow. totally got it. They totally helped me. They were like angels who got me to someone who also had an experience of adoption. My birth mother's best friend at the time that she had me was a woman who had relinquished a child in high school and had been searching for her son and did not know that my birth mother had also relinquished a child while they were friends. Like she was pregnant when they were very close. And so she got me to ultimately my half siblings and that got me to my birth mother. It's a lot more to it, but that's kind of the trajectory in a way. That's a very lucky first, first break. I mean, it doesn't get any luckier than that, right? No, I mean, look, it's like very interesting because we think our experiences are so unique. And then you, you go on this journey of search and you find two people like in the clo- in close proximity to this search that both have had family experiences, personal experiences around adoption. So I was like, oh, right. So this is a thing. Like, I think I'm so unique and there's not very many people who have my experience. And, and at the end of the day, that was really also another moment of like grounding for me to say, oh, right, there's more of us that have this experience than I think and how fortunate it was. Now, what happened in contacting my birth mother was different in terms of her interest and desire and ability to have a relationship or even meet me. But I did feel quite held and quite fortunate on that journey in finding people who just immediately understood. They didn't have, they, they just were on team April. They were like, we're on your team. We want to help. Let's go. Which felt like remarkable and amazing and sort of like not real. And before you went to that couple's house, had you told anybody that you were going to be doing this? Why that day as opposed to any other day? What what was your feeling? What was your state like? Was your heart racing as you were walking up to that front door? Well, you know, I had done some stuff. I mean, I think we we went to the records department in in Boston to try to get some records together. And, you know, like there had been some little movements that had happened. And, and, you know, I, I still don't know what ultimately made me say, okay, I, this was not planned. I was home for a, like I had a summer Friday, I think, you know, where I came from New York to Rhode Island, it was Friday the 13th. And my girlfriend and I, we had been talking a little bit and I said, you know what? Hey, I think, I think we should take a ride to Newport. And she was like, I'm in, let's go. We didn't really give it a ton of thought. It was just like, I was doing it. I had the address. I had sort of sat on it for a little while. And then we got in the car and we sort of made our little game plan on the way up there. Like, oh, we'll tell them we're doing research and, you know, who knows what we'll find. And we rolled up there, like totally not knowing what the heck was going to happen. And, you know, I was just in the flow. I, I really was nervous, but I wasn't scared. I was nervous and I was excited. 
I had been, you know, living this reality of being told that your mother loved you so much, uh, that she wanted a better life for you. You know, we love you. I was, I was in that flow of like, okay, cool. Like, so she wanted a better life. I have one. She'll be psyched when she gets, when she sees me, she'll be so happy. Right. Not knowing the like subterranean levels of emotion and things that had been buried along with, you know, uh, her, ex- her experiences of relinquishment of me and, and other things that I, I was just in this like space of like, I believed what people told me. Therefore I thought when I find her, she's going to be psyched and happy. And so after you met with the family and they were on your team, what was the next, uh, what was the next step? I, I started making some phone calls that, that, that day and literally within probably four hours of like, or five hours, I had a phone number in Hawaii, which is where my, my birth mother had moved soon after having me and stayed and ended up, um, that's where she ended up dying. I had a phone number and I called the number and it was indeed my half sister's house. I didn't say, I think you're my half sister or anything. I was like, I'd learned to move in these spaces of like, you know, not completely upsetting the whole matrix, but, um, I asked if my birth mother was there and that person said, no, but do you have her number? Here you go. And I was like, oh, it was that easy. So I called her and, you know, (laughs) you called her right away. Chat. Sure. I did. And I didn't even want to really, it was really weird. It was like, I had always thought that I would be a right on a lovely letter. And I was always wanted to be respectful of, of the, the, the person that doesn't know they're being looked for. Right. Like it just felt like the right thing to do. And, and, but you know, the way the day had moved, I was like, okay, this is now, this is happening. And I knew my, my, at my core that this wasn't about exposing someone or being super selfish. This was about like something that just had to happen and it had to happen then. And I was very matter of fact, but loving in the conversation. And she immediately said, yes, yes, <laughs> you're, you're my daughter. And uh, Can you yes. just walk us through? Can you just walk us through mm-hmm. how the conversation started? Sure. I said, "Hi, is this Helen?" She said, "Yes, this is." And I said, "My name is April. I was adopted. In my birthday is October twenty seventh, nineteen seventy one. I think that you are my birth mother." And there was a little bit of, you know, a pause. And <laughs> of course, I said, "Look, I, yeah, right, like, okay." I said, look, I have a beautiful life, a great family, and I wanted to know you. I never intended to call just the way things happen today. This is what the universe brought to me. So here I am. And, and her response was at first one that was very relieved, right? First of all, relieved that I was alive, that I was well, that her path that she set me on did create an opportunity for me in a life and love and, and, and opportunities and all these things. And she said something that I reflect back on now. And then I didn't really quite feel the gravity and the weight of this. But, you know, she said uh, two things. One, no one ever knew about us. And I had written notes of this conversation and I had put them away. And I, I recently found them in the last like year. And I, when reading those notes again from that phone call, I was like, she said us. And that was like everything to me. I'm like, there's an us there, like th- that she believed that we were connected and belonged together on some level. Right. So that was just very profound for me. Very, very, very pro- profound. That gave me such a, a deep emotional feeling. And then the other thing she said, which I could tell was coming with a lot of emotion from her was I would see horrible things that would happen to people that were adopted. and. I was always worried something bad had happened to you. And I was like, okay, so, and then I went and that moment went into the nothing bad happened. Like, no, I have a great family. And you know, a lot, like I was, I was already in that caregiving mode, you know, of like making sure that she was okay. And you know, the conversation then very quickly turned from her relief, her showing me some love to like, what do you want? And like, I don't really know have much more to say than this. It was really hard for me in Newport at the time. 
I went just to say, Hey, look, I know this is totally off, you know, it's probably completely taking you off guard. I, you know, may I have your address, may I send you some things, may I be in touch with you? And I, you know, love for you to do the same. And she said, of course, yes. And that was it. I hung up the phone. I never cried on the phone. And then after I felt like I had to cry. I didn't even really, I think it was sort of crying transactionally. I hadn't, I wasn't, I wouldn't feel a lot of this until much later. It really feel it to really cry until later. And that would come out in different ways and moments still does. Looking back now, what would you say shifted in you after that experience? Well, but the, yeah. Oh, tons. I mean, like there's like what I thought about love before finding her and what I thought about love after finding her. Like there was certainly a level of like, wait a second, y'all. Like you are sending kids down a really treacherous path of grounding this separation of family. And like, it's all love. It's all love. And that may be true, but like being then in this flow of like, here I am, don't you love me? <laughs> And then not getting that in return gutted me. It completely gutted me. And then I was like, like, like what other lies did you tell me? You know what I mean? Like, and what I didn't put together then and what I have put together since then, the 20 some odd years or whatever it is now is that there was love there. It was not what I needed necessarily, but there was love there. And there was also a deep level of complexity in Helen's life that made it impossible for her to turn into love in that moment. She hadn't healed from the many experiences that included me, my coming, my conception, my coming into the world, my being separated from her, all of that. Like she hadn't processed any of that. So there is definitely a, a turning point. And that turning point led to several things like understanding that I needed to take care of myself emotionally and mentally. And that I spent many years as a kid and, you know, like taking care of literally taking care of my emotional needs in such a way that were not being met by those around me specifically re related to adoption and differences of race. And that if I didn't stop and take care of myself in a new and different way, that, that I might be in danger of not being well. And also this like, fierce dedication to a more transparent, open, and realistic conversation about adoption with parents, with kids, with professionals, with the world to help people, you know, race and adoption to help people do better and to be in better service to what, uh, you know, a child needs. And the first step in that was CT WOCAT? It was the mentoring program. It was... Um, Mentor USA been, or something like that? Yeah, Mentoring USA was the sort of the incubator. I had been working at Kenneth Cole and, and, and had to get attached to myself to the mentoring program there, which was attached to Mentoring USA, which was uh, the former First Lady Matilda Cuomo's, one of her many initiatives while First Lady was doing mentoring and, and creating men mentoring programs in the state of New York. And I'd been doing that. So I had this idea that, um, and I'd been, you know, seeing this through line, this reality of, of what I was seeing kids struggle with. And a lot of it had to do with family structure. And most of the kids in another mentoring program that I was doing at work had some form of connectivity to the child welfare system, either they had been removed from their parents' care, they were experiencing foster care adoption, and they were predominantly overrepresented in this at-risk youth pool of kids. And so I said, okay, hold on a second. Like, you know, I had met a bunch of adopted adults who were part of support groups and things that I was in. And I thought, okay, so we're here, we're grown, you know, we've done a great deal of personal work. We continue to do our personal work. We've got an understanding of these things that is really unique. And why aren't we in connection to young people who are experiencing adoption or foster care? So that's how Adoptment, which was the first sort of nonprofit thing that I did came to life. And, you know, still going now and it's you know adopted adults or those who spent time in foster care mentoring to young people that are in foster care or have navigated foster care in uh, some way shape or form so let's just talk a little bit about the conception of adoptment. You were doing this thing with the city of New York or the state of New York. And then you, adoptment was your thing that you created and you were working a corporate job still. So it wasn't like you were getting paid for adoptment. So what was that 
like trying to balance all of that? And how did it tell me how did it start and how many people were involved in the very beginning and the early days and where did you find space and how, how did you get it off the ground? All that stuff is true about me you know, having a corporate job. It's again, like back to my constitution and then my upbringing. It's like we're like we're sort of hardworking New England folks. I grew up on a farm. Like labor was not a thing that I shied away from. And certainly something that I felt was meaningful just became a part of what I did. And and I was a rather serious person. I think growing up the way I did, I always sort of overcompensated probably would be the wrong way to say it, but wanted to solidify my place, you know, and, and not, I, I was, you know, I lived in, in, in pretty regular fear of like being sent back. That doesn't mean I didn't mess up. It doesn't mean that I did, I tested boundaries or anything like that. I did all that stuff and more, but I, I also kind of knew that I better do well. And it, it, a constant like sort of proving myself. So that that's, and that's, you know, if you, if you anecdotally and, and probably in research for sure, in different ways, it shows that adopted persons are like in that, like, got to prove yourself, you know, don't want to be an imposter, or you, you got to work harder. And then on top of it, being a person of color, it was like all in there, right? So it just was what I was going to do. And I, I just, a hard worker, and I, I was rather serious, you know, I was, ra- I was rather serious. I wasn't a person that came into New York City as a young adult and kind of like went down the rabbit hole of clubs and this and that. I had a, had a an important job and I had a lot of work to do. I had rather serious friends around me. And so I just, I just did it. And, you know, it just became part of what I did. I never even, th- I never really even thought about it actually in terms of it being all oh, this extra thing I had to do. Once I crossed the threshold of Harlem Dowling, which is I, amazingly in the Teresa Hotel, the famous Teresa Hotel in Harlem, I never looked back. I was like, this is just what I'm supposed to do in some way, shape or form, whether it's doing policy work or whatever. Like it was just like, this is always going to be part of how I move in the world and what I put my time towards. How did you even know how to set it up structurally and how many people you would need helping you? I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> <laughs> no clue. I really didn't have a clue, but you know, I didn't have a clue when I had my first corporate job. I was like, Oh, you're going to hire me to do that. I'm like, I'm not even sure what I'm supposed to do, but I'm going to figure it out. So I figured it out. You know, it was like, I had been in enough mentoring programs where, you know, there was this like structural way in which curriculum had to be built in terms of activities and such. Um, But the biggest thing that I knew I had was an ability to connect with young people and an ability to share openly and vulnerably to create relationship and validation and the ability to be in, in right relationship. But like, so that part I knew the other parts were harder, right? Like I wasn't a curriculum developer, I w- but uh, you know, I was a marketer and I was a marketer that had to put big projects together and knew that there were, you know, and did strategic plans and X plus Y equals Z and you got to put this. So that part really was not easy, but I, I knew the things I had to do. I filled in the blanks with other people. Like I did, I started doing a lot of research on what existed and not much did in terms of engaging young people in this deeper conversation about their family experiences and differences of race. I found a mentor who was running the program through Kenneth Cole, who was running the program at a school on the, on the East side of New York that became a mentor to me and helped me kind of get a model together, you know, and then I worked with Mentoring USA and we put together a, a curriculum and it's it's morphed over the years into a few different you know in, in different ways, but most of the, the 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 bedrock is the same as it was back then, sixteen seventeen years ago. Do you remember what the first meeting was like? Yeah, I do. You know, thankfully, I had this great partner in Harlem Dowling, which uh, Harlem, Harlem Dowling Westside Center, which is no longer in its full existence, but has merged with Children's Village in Harlem. It's it was an agency for black and brown kids run. Predominantly by people of color. This is a movement in Manhattan, in the city of New York, maybe even the state many years ago. They had the good fortune of meeting some folks there that believed in mentoring, had, had especially the leadership, but also like the, the on the ground social workers, like just under, knew how to create relationships with kids. And I've just always been good with kids. So I just put it all out on the table. And there were some. You know, there was definitely some resistance. We had these were, and, and what did I say? Like very naively, when when the leadership at the organization said, "What population of kids do you want to work with?" and I said, "Well, let's start with the kids that need the most help." When that was therapeutic foster care, what that means is, you know, 
you know, involved in foster care that may have complex medical conditions and or behavioral health, mental health, and have been categorized as such doesn't mean that many, many of those things, those categories like didn't really make sense to me. But regardless, they were in the sort of therapeutic foster care group, if you will. And, and those are the young people that I, I said, let's do that. And, and so these are kids who may have had some criminal justice or some criminal history, right, wrong, and different, you know, probably for doing stuff that any white kid would do and not have an infraction for. Uh, That's another story or part of the story. But these are kids who had had many placements, had some had mental health diagnoses, you know, abuse, neglect, just kids who had really tough life circumstances that they were navigating in very few soft places. And I walked into that room with the other mentors saying, I don't know, what's going to happen, but here we go. And we've been walking into those rooms that same way for the last, you know, however many years. And it's gotten easier, obviously. And I've, you know, learned how to really help other people, other grownups create relationships with, with kids. You usually have very different experiences than they did as young people. It doesn't always work. I mean, trust and believe it's like, you know, it doesn't always work. And there have been times where I was so emotionally drained by, the experiences that these young people have had to endure that I just didn't think I could do it anymore. And I was like, well, really April, if they can get through, you can be in support of them. So it was all kinds of things. And mostly it was just like a triumph on some level for them and for all of us as mentors, because they didn't need to trust that they didn't have to trust us. You know, they didn't have to be vulnerable to us. They, they're in, in large, large, largely too. It, we were overrepresented with white mentors. I mean, I they did a great job to recruit people of color, but there was also the white people in the room were their minority and still are on, on, on a lot of uh, in a lot of cases in terms of that racial dynamic. So there was a lot of effort that went into building trust for the young people because who are these white people coming in that are going to save the day and be our mentors you know like there was so much to unravel with that you switched many corporate jobs over those years these last 20 years and there were periods where you didn't have a job you were in between jobs but yet you kept this going. How, how did you, how did that work? It was just I was committed. You know, I mean, my corporate my corporate life is one of like like in some ways getting bored quickly. In some ways, like not really liking the whole corporate leadership thing. I was in leadership positions at a young age. I was usually the only person of color, if not the only the not often the only woman, but often the only woman of color in, in circumstances. And I mean, that just was is was exhausting. And amazing too, because I, when I found myself in those situations, I was like, oh, wow, like I'm here. Um, but, you know, I, I often had a limited amount of tolerance and patience for doing what I did my whole life, which was like navigate whiteness without a whole lot of skill and will on the part of the white person. So in corporate America, that got old quick. I, but I, you know, I was good at what I did as a marketer and principled in a lot of ways. Some of the moves that I made were were real principled moves in terms of not liking what a company was doing and not really having a place to do anything about it other than leave. So there was a lot of movement there. And I, I really didn't, you know, some of, some of the, the movements were harder than others, but, you know, I never really cared about when people like, oh, April, too many things on your resume. I'm like, I, I never really cared. I, I'm not really sure why. I mean, it, in the moment, it probably was much harder than I'm giving it credit for now. But like, I always knew I was going to work. I knew I'd never be homeless or hungry because of I had a, I had family support and this you know obviously the mentoring experiences around what I saw young people not having were like so important because it gave me perspective so I never really got you know super worried I had hard times and I there were times where I didn't have enough or I didn't think I had enough but I probably did and, uh, and I was never homeless or hungry so there's that but that steady commitment to adopt men was what mattered to me most. The other, the, the jobs I could, I really, I, I, they were hard to leave sometimes, but I, that really, even just subconsciously, I knew what was important. And again, it doesn't say that leaving these companies or being, you know, exiting or being exited a company wasn't easy and not having financial security was like the worst, but I kind of always knew I was going to be okay. Were you having to fund adoptment? out of your own pocket? 
Oftentimes, yes. There was there was usually a commitment up, uh, up, up, upon the agency to do some kind of like shared or you know full responsibility in some cases and some points in time for refreshments and outings. So we did get some financial support. But what would generally happen is that I would want better or more for these kids, and the just budget wasn't there. So I I ended up, I mean. Some of the big, the, the biggest in, single investment I think I've made in anything has been that program from young people needing rent to needing a place to stay. And yeah, I would go without uh, to make sure they had. I mean, that was just and continues today on some level. It's just what I decided to commit my, you know, whatever financial resources I had, you know, um, to. And you know, again, some agencies had the, the capacity and the and the the ability to do more than others, but. You know, and the, and a lot of time our basics were covered, but sometimes they weren't. And if I wanted to do something extra or thought that the program needed something, it was on me to get it. And then individually, young people often needed things that they didn't have anywhere else to get them, and it, they would call on me to help. And it wasn't always easy to do, but I, you know, I, t- I tr- tried to always find a way. Did you ever think about giving it up or stopping it or passing it off to someone else because it was getting to be too much? No. What I did was make sure that there were, there were times where I just was so hopeless because, you know, being around young people who have endured unimaginable things, you know, we used to like secondary trauma, I guess it's called, right? It's like just internalizing some of these experiences. I knew at certain points I needed to take better care of myself emotionally. So that was seeking therapy, that was leaning into yoga, that was learning about healthy eating, that was about making sure that my foundation and my my physical body was cared for and a priority in order to then be able to give to the level that I felt like I needed to. So I never once questioned whether I would do it or not. It was more of like, what do I need in order to be at my best level of output? It also forced me to sort of deal with the stuff that was really hard in my life, right? Like, and give it perspective, you know, there were some dark places in my growing up years that were just really, really, really hard. I never really felt like I had the the right to own that. And, you know, part of seeing even darker places and, and harder things that young people navigated was a recognition of the own hard, my own hard places, and then also some perspective around what it looks like to have resilience and be a survivor and be in some ways in service to humanity, if that makes sense. What happened with your mother? You mentioned something about her dying. Did you ever get a chance to meet her or connect with her at all? So after a couple of rounds of letters, one in which I asked about my birth father and which she replied back that she did not know who my sperm donor was. She was raped and hearing from me has made her very depressed. Uh, that was the last like written communication I received from her. At that point, I wrote her back saying, you know, how sorry I was that that experience happened to her, that I would respect her privacy and no, at that point, I didn't say I would respect her privacy. At that point, I said, I'm so sorry that happened. I hope that we, you know, can have some kind of a connection in the future. At that, but several, w- several months later, I feel like everything I sent to her, the timing, I don't remember exactly, but I got everything back that she was sent, that I was sent, that I sent to her. So I had sent pictures and some things, some artifacts from my life, and she sent it all back. And here I am thinking the envelope was red, full of red like, or opened or opened, unopened, opened, opened. So I knew she had seen them. And truth is like, I was actually like, it could be worse. She could have just destroyed them and never sent them back. She, she probably got a sense that these were sentimental and she sent them back to me. So it sucked, but it was also like, all right, so at least I have my, my things back on some level. And so that put me on pause with a lot of the search stuff. I, I re I re engaged a little bit and found a half sibling they also were not open to being in touch with me. So I then I really put, I put like, I, I put a stop to it. I was like, I'm not, this is it. I'm not, um, I'm not doing this anymore. It was too much. It just, you know, was too emotionally heavy. 
then, so two things. One, the person who I found who was connected to my birth mother who had also relinquished a child wrote to my birth mother and said, you need to know April. I, I have something to tell you too. I'm a birth mother. That letter went unanswered. Another guy, a guy, the guy that she actually described as my birth father was easy to find. And, you know, upon looking at him, he's white, she's white. There's no way he's my dad. They definitely had a thing going on. He was amazing. I got in touch with him. He totally embraced me. He was like, you're definitely her kid. You look just like her. You sound just like her. We had a romance. I loved her madly. I did not know she was pregnant and he knew her right around the time. There are some people that probably would want to know who you are. There was one person in particular. He's your cousin. I'm going to tell him you exist. He also wrote her, Helen, a beautiful letter that I cherish to this day about how important it would be for her to know me. That went unanswered by Helen. And then I met a half, a half cousin who was amazing and was a grounding for me. He went to Helen before she died and said, Hey, auntie, like I, I know April. I want you to know April. What can I do? And she was like, the way he described it was she lit a joint. She was a heavy pot smoker. It doesn't neither here nor there. It doesn't really matter, but I do think it adds to the narrative. Um, and she said, I'm happy that you know her and that's good for you. I'm not going to be in a relationship with her. And that's that. And it nearly broke my cousin's heart, I think, because he was so loving and kind to me and thought this could be healing for everybody as I did. And she just not, wasn't up for it. Fast forward several years later, she passed away. I found out like a week after, which was like heart wrenching to just know that she was, had been gone. And I didn't know before it was just so complicated. And upon, you know, I would not even so if it was her deathbed, I would maybe we, a week before, I don't know the timing, but she had told her caregivers that she had another kid and that whether or not she instructed the caregivers to tell my half siblings or not is gray for me, but either way they did. And my half siblings found me and about five, six years ago, we all met for the first time. I am in relationship with having met my, my youngest half sibling in the last year. And so it's, it's fascinating negotiation of this new relationship. Um, one that I've longed for and also one that's really hard to make happen in real time. So Helen left the planet without meeting me as an adult. And, um, I'll always be, be sad about that. I'll always mourn that. I'll always feel sad for her, feel sad for me. And I don't know anything about my biological father other than what DNA tells me through ancestry, which is she's white, obviously. So any part of me that's black, I now know. And I've got some hits that are relative hits, but they're far away from anything that is, is detectable in terms of a parent. So I'm on the path. I'm hopeful, but I'm cautiously optimistic. Although with, you know, coronavirus and all this stuff, I think with more people leaving the planet, I worry <laughs> that they might be too. And what would you say has shifted in you since since your mom passed and you connected with your your family? Just at, in terms of your work, your focus, your commitment to working with adopted kids. I think you know the, the adopt adoptment was like a gateway to like this whole career shift for me in terms of like moving into a space of being like a professional in adoption and foster care. So the experiences of my, my effort to reconnect and then not being able to reconnect uh, with my birth mom just put an added layer of like commitment to doing better. And that, that came about that. That's how adoptment came about. Ultimately was like trying to find a way to, to, to use this energy and the whole experience of it made me committed to looking at policies and practices, understanding why we do what we do, in terms of like keeping things a secret and not giving people their whole truth and, and not really in, in, insisting that parents operate in more of an open fashion and being able to be willfully ignorant of the things that we know can be challenging for adopted persons. We're overrepresented in attempts to suicide. We're overrepresented in, in, in challenges with mental health and, and drug addiction. We're, we're overrepresented in a lot of areas that make it urgent that we're not just uh, transacting our way through these things that we're really being transformational about. Uh, also, family preservation. Some kids can stay with their family of origin with some support and help. 
not just be extracted and, and, and adopted into another matrix. Like there's a way to do some much more elevated work and that. So it, it all my, my experiences has made me much more committed to like bigger picture stuff and what we can all do better in terms of identity development, supporting kids, navigating family, navigating difference. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned that you've shifted into more of a speaking role and doing workshops and trainings. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. So several years ago, I left corporate America and I, and I became the CEO of a research and policy organization for adoption and foster care. And that was like me just getting deep into data and research and understanding a piece of the, the world of adoption and foster care that I didn't fully have a grasp of. And that was a gateway to knowing that I have a unique set of skills to really help people reset some of their operating systems around the di most difficult things in our life. You know, adoption and foster care really embody so much of the what's hard about our lives, differences of race, class, and culture, mental health, market forces, abuse, neglect, gender differences, like you name it, it's all in adoption and foster care. And, you know, with that in mind, there is a specific way in which I have had to negotiate hard places and complexity with myself and others in mind that now has translated into a real platform to to coach and to teach, but to do so with the spirit of, yeah, I know these systems and institutions are, are racist, are classist, are xenophobic, are all these things. I know that. I know that people are generally, generally, generally well-intended, although there's a, there are bad actors in the matrix for sure. And that because I was raised by white people who I love and adore, I approach diversity, difference, you know, c complex relationship, identity development, all these things that are my sort of specialties, if you will, with a lot of love, right? And respect. So like I, I say to parents, like all parents are my parents, right? You come into a workshop with me. If I've made you more fearful, more upset, more confused, or made your mind more or your heart make more chaotic leaving than when you came in, I haven't done my job well. You know, a lot of times... I think what happens is, you know, we, we just sort of are a borderline activist advocate moment and, you know, you turn people off right away and I, and then they, then they leave and they shut down and they don't want to, they don't feel like they can do anything. I, I, I've had to learn how to make space for where people are along a journey and to say, I didn't get what I need from you, but I'm still ready, willing, and able to work for, you know, work at this. And that's what's translated now into like a whole platform for opening difficult discussions around family, differences of race, class, and culture, identity through my podcast, through speaking, through training, through consulting at schools and with school systems. And, you know, hopefully now getting more into some corporate work and, and, and leadership. Because if anybody knows how to navigate white people as a person of color, it's someone who's had to live in a white environment, the, you know, for the first 17 years of their life. And it doesn't make me better or worse. It just means that I also can very, very clearly see that just because someone isn't moving dramatically doesn't mean they don't love you and doesn't mean they're not trying. There's definitely urgency now, so but you know there's, there's, you have to give people some space for this in some way, in some cases. If there's a, say a white family or, or, or even just a white one, one parent, single parent who wants to adopt a brown child, what advice would you, would you give to them? You know, the thing that I have, I help adoptive parents in this same way do if they're adopting a kid of color and they're not a black or brown kid, it's really like an exercise in self-reflection and an assessment of their life and their intake. So it's really like, like first things first is like, you know, everybody likes to say, Oh, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take them to the African American day parade. We're not racist. We don't see color, but my, the work that I want parents to do and, and everybody to do is to take it like much more in depth in terms of what do you do every day? What do you do every single day? Look at, look at some of the things you take in some of the people that you're around you know, being committed and loving a kid 
is about is seeing them as a kid of color, obviously taking care of their hair. That's a whole nother podcast, but there are now resources where my parents didn't have any, <laughs> um, but there are resources now for that. But it's really about like, I, I, I talk about this privileged personal operating system that many white people live in that don't even know they're living in it. So they don't argue their way out of traffic tickets. They, or they, they can argue their way out of a traffic ticket. They can, you know, open something and drink it before they pay for it without ever giving it a second thought. They can walk out of the store with something not in a bag and not worry about about getting stopped, you know, all these things. So it's about resetting that. And it's about a realization of, of the things, the deep work that you have to do in order to make a safe, uh, physical, emotional, and psychological space for a kid who will be in your care. And, you know, it, that's easier said than done. There's a lot of, there's a lot of deep and detailed work that goes into that, uh, that a lot of people are willing to do. And there's a long tail on it, but really starts with the individual and, the, and asking some really tough questions of yourself and your extended family member, because you might feel uh, inspired by this idea, but Uncle Joe may not. And if he's coming over for Thanksgiving, your whole family matrix will have to change because that will not be safe for your kid. So it's this, it's deep and it's, it's a lot of work. And we haven't done that uh, in many cases. We've just said, oh, here's your black or brown kid. Have a nice life. Good luck. And let's say you are adopted or you're, you're in foster care and you want to find your birth parents, do you have any advice in that regard? Yeah. I mean, there's two different, there's two different things. It's like the, the transactional stuff and then there's like the emotional transformational stuff. And so the tra transactional stuff can be found with some Google searches. Like you can find out in your home state if you have access to your original birth certificate or not. Some states are opening, some aren't. You go and you ask, you know, who is safe around you, parents or otherwise, like, is there in, more information? Is this more that you can give me? Is there written paperwork that I have? So like getting, gathering and, and keeping that very organized is, you know, and doing the Google searches, looking for search angels, that's all out there. And that's all, you know, sort of pretty easy to find on some level. The harder part is, you know, making sure you have mental health resources that are adoption competent. Like I don't recommend anybody go down the search and reunion um, road until they have done some really deep work and have a scaffolding of mental health around them. Um, even if they feel like, no, 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 I'm good. Just make sure you have someone that you can talk to because these things are not easily navigated emotionally. Oftentimes they require some extra support, but I would say do it. You know, if there, it's in your spirit to do it, I would do it and do it on your terms, do it in a way that feels safe for you. Don't let other folks uh, who maybe want to push you or hold your back be in charge. You're in charge and tell them exactly what you need. And either they're going to rise to the occasion and be that support for you or they're not. And you'll know, and then you'll find other ways to be, um, you know, in support of your own needs. Awesome. And then finally, if someone is wanting to maybe start a foundation or a nonprofit not necessarily for adoption, but just for anything. What advice would you give? Would you give to that person uh, for starting a nonprofit, going down the road of being? Yeah, yeah. They have something they're passionate about, kind of like you had with adoption and working with kids. Like, what what would you say the first step should be? You know, as it may seem pretty basic, but it's like, what's the vision? What do you want to do? I mean, I, I think it's today for me. It's less about structuring structuring an, an organization as a nonprofit or a for profit than it is about having a really smart plan to be successful for the long term. So for-profit, non-profit, I'm actually leaning more sometimes into for-profit because like some of this great work out there that needs to get done need not be, you know, a less than idea and more of a like a premium <laughs> value on humanity that people need to pay for. So I think it's just about solidifying your, what it is that you aim to do and, you know, getting the help and support from guides and mentors and people that could help you that have gone down the road before. I think those are all things that will help kind of ensure some success down the road. Wonderful. Well, I always like to end these podcast interviews with a little reflection on your trajectory as discussed in the conversation and your childhood. And I think you kind of did half the work for me <laughs> by pointing out that the Disney books were kind of a way a surrogate really of making you feel that sense of completion or unification with your, your origin or your, your authenticity. And yeah, I think, I think it's really interesting because I've seen it in literally every interview. And I just started asking that question sort of, I don't know, there, I had a hunch that there was some connection there, but I'm curious, do you feel that sense of connection uh, after 
sort of articulating your story and seeing what your f- very favorite activity was as a child, do you sense that connection of, of kind of a coming home and that's why you were into those books? Oh, there's no question. There's no question. They were, they're deeply a part of who I am. Like I said, like the way they felt, the way they felt in my hand, what I saw on those pages, absolutely. There is a connection to that. And this idea that life can be complicated and start out complicated. And at the end, you know, we may not all put our ball gown on and go dance around like Cinderella and Prince Charming, but there's something very empowering and, and fairy tale like, if you will, when you say, okay, this is my life. These are these experiences that I've had. And yet I'm here, I'm strong. And it, you know, it's, it's in a lot of ways, a beautiful life and an existence. It does feel like there is a, a way to move through adversity and to a place of, of real connectivity and, and beauty. So I, I think it all does play right back. So it's a great way that you've structured this whole dialogue. Well, the other thing too is that you mentioned that you read them hundreds of times, and it's to me, and I could just be making this up, but it sounds like you you kind of knew what your purpose was coming into this life, and you have to remind yourself of how it goes and how it works and what the storylines are, so you wouldn't get distracted when the time came for you to sort of recognize that in your own journey and then in the journey of helping other people. So mm. I just I just want to acknowledge you for for your persistence mm-hmm. and your bravery and putting yourself out there so much because that's something that I think that's really it takes a lot of courage to do that to take those steps and to you know walk in that house mm. <laughs> and make up that story and make those phone calls and send those letters and not take it personally when you got rejected in that way. Mm-hmm. And I think that because you were rejected by your mom, it probably makes you that much more committed to those kids who, as you say, come from backgrounds that are just, can be so much worse. Mm -hmm. And they, you know, they, they really only connect with people who can identify with that level of pain. And I think that you, you inadvertently brought that into your, your world for that higher purpose of being someone who could authentically connect with those kids. Mm. So I just want to Mm. acknowledge that. And, um, and say thanks. It was a really enjoyable conversation. Mm, you bet. Thanks for all you do, Light. Appreciate you. Absolutely. And we'll obviously list your contact information. You mentioned you have a podcast, which is called Born in April, Raised in June. <laughs> Born in June, Raised in April. Born in June, Raised in April. Okay. Mm-hmm. And uh, if someone wanted to volunteer with Adoptment or with anything else you're doing, is that something that's available? Yeah. I mean, uh, we're largely based in New York now. I mean, this is a program I want to take nationally. So yeah, if folks want to reach out, I'd be more than happy to hear from them. The idea is that we would find ways to bring adoptment to other places. So that's, that's, the, that's the future. But for right now, we're in New York. Yeah. And you can find me on my website. And you're also speaking all over the world. So maybe at some point you'll be speaking at a workshop or a conference near them. That's exactly right. Perfect. All right. Well, thank you so much, April, and good luck with everything in in the world of adoption. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening to my interview with April Dinwiddie. As she mentioned, she has her own podcast, which is called Born in June, Raised in April, which I was honored to be featured on. I really love how gracefully April is able to navigate this race, class, and culture conversation, so I hope that you will also follow more of her work. And if you like these kinds of conversations, please subscribe to At the End of the Tunnel and make sure to check out the archive for more fascinating talks with regular folks who started incredible movements. These conversations run the gamut from harrowing tales of overcoming depression and anxiety to making 180 degree life reversals in the name of finding their purpose and following their passion. If you find an episode that you really love, I hope that you will post about it tag us, share it with your friends, and also don't forget to rate the podcast so other people can find it. As always, you can also find links to everything that April and I discussed in the show notes, as well as a transcript of our entire interview. Thanks again for listening. I'll see you next week with a new conversation on At the End of the Tunnel.